Hey guys, and welcome to the Lunge and Lift podcast. Today, Ash and myself are discussing program principles. So it's a fun topic ahead. Um, firstly, Matt Fraser leaving CrossFit. Finally, what's he doing? He's uh, taking time out. I think he's um, hanging up his boots while he's at the top. It's probably better than going in half-hearted. I think a lot of people, it's like, the, I, I talk about it as like the American TV series approach where you just keep grinding it out mm. to make more money when actually something like competitive CrossFit, it takes your whole life's commitment. You've got to center everything. Like he said it in his post, I think I had to be so selfish, like friends, family all had to sacrifice as well. And I think the added benefit of winning a sixth compared to six compared to five compared mm. to another year of sacrificing your whole life he's probably just said you know what i'm quite happy with five i, I don't gain much more by winning a sixth i'm probably s like successful and famous enough to make a career out of crossfit after crossfit kind of like throning yeah um so there's no point me putting my body through the ringer again to just uh, get an extra sixth he's already, he's he's currently the best ever until mm. somebody wins six, then, you know, um, he's probably going to be all right. So, fair play. Yeah, what do you I, think? I was. I spoke to Hannah about it, and I was just like, at the end of the day, firstly, five wins is a better anagram for his name, Fraser. I think you know six. <laughs> like, where do you put that number six? Then it just it's just not the same. Yeah. Um, but I think definitely hanging his boots up now when he's at the top hasn't been knocked off you know he's as i said he could probably win another one he probably could he's fit enough and he said but this as as we've mentioned in previous podcasts and this is why i kind of want to start with this because it takes so much sacrifice mm -hmm. and he he the way he even said that you know it, it it takes it out of you and it consumes your life and he's focused everything on that and that just shows you what is achievable and mm -hmm. he's obviously set the goal of being the best ever and he has become the best ever you know because realistically now someone else has to come along and try and win six back to back so not only five because obviously he hit thrown ins and then it was like right i now need a fifth so now yeah. he is the best so it's like as you say six is all well and good but the, the cost of that sixth just so if someone else yeah. wants to win six years straight go be like be your guest basically like fair play to you for putting in six years of sacrifice but i think that's like the reality of it so i'm just yeah. like it's gutting because obviously it's really good to watch him perform because he mm. is just unreal. But on the flip side, you know, this is an opportunity for people like Noah and stuff like that to potentially get that win now. And I think it's just, it's like an unselfish thing that he said, right, I'm going to step back now. I'm going to stop winning for you guys. So you guys, someone else can now take the throne. And in a, mm. in a, it's, it's like not a big headed way, but he, he's proven himself. That's the thing. So he can be yeah. big headed because he's proven himself. And I, I think it just made me really think about, especially with today's topic being program principles and like smart goals. And he's obviously that initial goal of being, I want to be the best and he's achieved it now. So but did he think it was realistic at the start? Who knows? So uh, that was obviously his yeah. mindset going into it. So yeah. Ash, this, this, this break it down this. So obviously I've touched on there, smart goals. What is a smart goal and why is it essential when writing a goal? Yeah. So I think um, when you're thinking about programming or designing a program for a purpose, you need to get clear on what that purpose is. And everyone's talked about smart goals to death in all areas of life. And the reasons it's stuck around are that it is a great framework to uh, like center your goal around. Like it's a clear list of criteria to evaluate whether your goal is actually functional and I think a lot of people have airy fairy goals of oh, I want to be fitter, I want to be stronger without applying the smart principles to that goal. It's actually quite impractical and hard to center a program around. So people have different um, interpretations of the letters in smart. So we're just going to put our interpretation on them and discuss the the elements that are relevant for uh, applying them in a training program. So the first one, S for specific. So the goal needs to be as clear as possible so you can visualize it 
and you know that you've achieved it. So I think a lot of people have yeah like these vague goals and getting stronger if you're not sure how you're measuring your strength we're jumping ahead again to the second one uh if you're not sure how you're measuring it if it's not uh clearly identified then yeah you don't stand the chance of achieving it because it was never clear what it was in the first place yeah i guess like obviously with when something's specific you just ha- you have to know okay i say no that's a bit definitive you have to have a good idea of being what you want and that's the main thing because they say i want to be stronger okay cool what's strength so mm-hmm. th- th- and then that goes deep what is strength to you yeah. but so and you have to understand what being stronger is so then obviously this is then when we can quickly uh, move on to the measurable one because mm-hmm. this then starts giving us a bit of foundation for the spef- for the specificness <laughs> i'm not gonna go there the, uh, i'm gonna try the, the specificity yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to say with a silly face as well. Um, yeah, so basically it gives you the foundations for the specific part of the um, the, the word. So, yeah, so measurable. There are obviously when it comes to, say, use, utilizing strength as a, an example, obviously weight being stronger in a certain lift or you might be a power lifter where you're saying, right, I want to be stronger at the bench squat and deadlift. So there's obviously the three so that specific goal starts to become a little bit like broad. So you might have to focus on, um, actually, I don't want to jump ahead too much as well, because then again, it, these all interlink so much and this yeah. is what we really want to get across, but let's just stick with this measurable part. Sorry. Um, so yeah, obviously with the weight on the bar, it's a really clear, concise measuring target. Uh, when it comes to body composition or weight, you've obviously got clear indicators there, especially if you're using the same bit of kit over and over, because yeah. it means that's the consistent part of the measuring tool, just like a weight is pretty much consistent unless you go to different gyms. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what, what, other, what other points would you say there, mate? On, yeah, I think measurable is key, not only for establishing if you've achieved the goal or not. So have you improved your one rep max, for example, but also for tracking your progress against it over time. So having, if it's something that's vague or unmeasurable, you can't tell whether you're actually on track to achieving it. Whereas if it's something like yeah, kilos on the bar, you'll have an idea over time, even if you're not constantly testing your one rep max, you can still measure how much you lift in a certain movement. And if that's progressing over time, then you've got a good idea that your one rep max is going over time. And you make a really good point on using the same consistent piece of kit, because if the quality of your measuring is poor, then you're guessing to some extent. Mm. If you always use different scales, if you have different people do your body fat measurements, you know, there's you're adding in a margin for error, which can confuse the program and actually be misleading as to whether it's working or not. So it's really important to know what you're measuring, not measure too many things, focus on the key key performance indicators and uh, consistently track them over time to keep uh, consistent on the plan or adjust it if necessary. Mm. So obviously then moving on to the next one, which is an achievable and this one i guess has a couple of meanings as well as you said like now there's like people use the word attainable as well for it but it all kind of means a similar sort of thing so but being achievable what what makes something achievable yeah i think um it needs to be realistic which is what some people put as the r um but you know there's not much sense saying i'm going to run a hour and a half marathon when you've never run in your life before and uh, you want to do it in 12 weeks so it needs to be within the bounds of possibility and something else I think is important when you're talking about achievability is keeping it in your sphere of control so if you say I want to win the London Marathon for example depending who turns up will have a huge impact on whether that's achievable for you or not so saying I want to run you know a two-hour marathon if you're Kipchoge that is within his realm of control so that's I would say is achievable and realistic whereas you know if you're yeah you don't know who's going to turn up you say I want to win that is out of your control so I think when you're looking at competition particularly you've got to have uh, goals that are 
within yourself and obviously you can hope for a rank you can hope for a position but if there's other people who can uh impact the outcome then accepting that and just it's that it's getting all cheesy now but it's basically mm. just doing your best mm. and um not focusing too much on what other people are doing because that's only going to distract you from making your own personal progress yeah i feel that uh, again it's, it's like what we do is talk about matt fraser but because again <laughs> being obviously we see we're both in the crossfit sphere and he he is the best person that's performed crossfit for consecutively for five years and so forth and something that he always said well, i remember it was on the documentary and he said like he doesn't see the bright lights all around him he doesn't see all the other competitors at the end of the day, everyone is there to win mm. you're not there to take part you're there to win right so all you can do is put in your maximum effort and know that when you leave that floor, whether it's a competition floor or just, you know, get back home after a busy day, that you know you've been out and you've done everything you could to achieve that goal of the day. And if you've done that, then cool, you're, you're, that's all you can do. Yeah. And then the next thing is it's just like, which kind of leads into this bit of like the realistic part or relevant. And it, I, I know that we, so the so R stands for relevant or realistic. So there's the, the two uh, words for that. Now, I said I said that prior to this call, I think this this smart should be changed to like smatter because it's like it should be you need to look through that specificness, how measurable it is, if it's say achievable and then time bound, and then you can look if it's realistic. Because then only once you've gone through it once can you see if it's realistic or not. Because as I think leading, leading back to this hour and a half marathon in two weeks, mm. like how do you know it's not realistic until you've kind of given yourself the goal in a way? So yeah. because obviously and I, we're terrible at this, but we've, I've even then jumped ahead there to time bound. I said <laughs> 12 weeks. So this is so entwined that you don't go through it once you yeah. go through it multiple times. So let's just obviously then backpedal a little bit. So obviously we've had achievable. So now going to R and being relevant. Yeah. So I think uh, a lot of people have a lot of things that they would like to achieve with their training and having a, a bit of a check-in to say, is this actually, does this all fit together? Like, is this relevant for who I am as a person, who I am as an athlete, or is this just an arbitrary thing that I've seen someone do on Instagram, therefore I think I want to do it myself? For example, if you are a CrossFit athlete, is running a, say, two-hour 30 marathon relevant to becoming a, the best CrossFit athlete uh, you could be? You might be able to do it. It might be within the realms of possibility and with enough time, training, and dedication, you could get there. But if actually where you want to end up overall is to be the best competitive CrossFit athlete you can. It's probably not the best use of your training time and working on a better Fran time or something that actually carries over more to the sport of CrossFit is probably a better investment. And it all um, is pulling in the same direction, whereas the amount of effort, effort it would take to run a sub-230 marathon is probably all-consuming and will negatively impact the rest of your training. So just having a bit of a yeah an assessment of how well is this connected to me and where I want to be overall or is it just some random romantic idea that I've uh, dreamt up yeah I think then obviously moving on to time bound is because this just encapsulates it all in a way of just saying okay right this is what I want to do and I want to do it by this date so then as so like you utilizing say the keeping this two and a half marathon example is in like cool okay 12 weeks mm, no okay so we now look at that realistic or relevant like or achievable and we say right that's probably not achievable yet based on my current thing so you might go out and do a test run and say right cool okay i'm going to run say a 5k and now you do that 5k you times it out by four times yep because it's about 20 or it's 21k in it 21.1k i think for a half. Yeah, for a half. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So 42.2, obviously, for the main yeah. thing. Sorry, I forgot we we're talking about marathon again. Um, so, but yeah, so you obviously times it out. You say, cool, okay. So I've got this amount of time for my 5K. I'm going to times it out. Mm, okay. So I'm uh, only a couple of hours over what <laughs> that was originally planned. So having that, you have to have something to base it off. And sometimes you just don't. So this mm -hmm. is why, obviously, the goal needs to be assessed continuously when you're on your journey. But having even if you went balls towards us said right i wanted 12 weeks to have a two and a half hour marathon 
and you started two weeks in and you're like okay cool i is this going to happen is this realistic now so then you have a little call okay i've got a measure that i'm going to use so that's why we talk about this so we can use say the 5k as the example mm -hmm. so right cool i'm going to run my 5k how fast do i need to run 5k to get a two and a half hour marathon if you're say 10 minutes for off of that pace then you know you've got a lot of work. So then 12 weeks then becomes that reality of it's not really realistic anymore. So maybe if we can say in a year's time, and then then it might put you off it. And then you say, okay, yeah. it's not actually that relevant for me because I don't really want to put a year's worth of work. And again, that's not necessarily the problem because it's good to have then experimented with it. And there's there's nothing wrong with starting a, a goal yeah. and then going, do you know what? Fuck this, it's not for me. Yeah. And it's and it's and also it's I, when you said about like the relevant thing it's I, I even with myself it's like my own current goal obviously where I'm focusing a bit more on the endurance side of stuff and uh, one of my clients um she asked me she goes like aren't you worried about getting weaker and I was like oh, obviously I don't want to get weaker but that's just part of it you know my focus currently is on endurance and it just means I have a fun journey on the other side when I come back to some strength work Mm -hmm. because i have this natural potential to be stronger and i still maintain a good level of base strength anyway even without lifting so it's like for me to to basically rather than trying to keep up with some strength training as well you know like keep my lifts nice and heavy and then do my endurance stuff because they, they just they don't complement each other yeah so you might as well just go balls deep on the endurance stuff and then leave your leave the strength training at this maintaining phase where you just still keep a movement mechanics and stuff like that fresh mm -hmm. but you know it's again that for me it become relevant because i started to ask myself do i why am i trying to maintain my like, why am i trying to keep strong is it for instagram or is it for, <laughs> for me and yeah. that's thing because it's like oh i'm now this i'm now like the runner guy type thing and it's like and i'm i'm definitely not the runner guy and, <laughs> and i want to be the strong guy and i am the strong guy in my mind so it's like but taking that step away sometimes has a bit of a you know you have to be you have to basically accept it yeah I think you make a really good point um, around the evaluation of the cost and the sacrifice. And that ties back to Matt Fraser, actually. The, let's keep bringing him up. <laughs> keep bringing him up. Um, basically, once we'll send you go him through... We'll podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give him a little tag. Um, once you've gone through that smart goal-setting process and you've figured it out and you've realized that it's going to take uh, a huge amount of effort to achieve that goal, you've just got to evaluate, is it worth it to me? And I think... Matt Fraser, having done it five times already, he knows what it takes to win the CrossFit Games. And he's like, actually, it's not worth it to me. And for that two and a half hour marathon, like you've, you've figured out where you are, you figured out what sort of rate of progress is reasonable and actually achievable. And you think, actually, to run a two and a half hour marathon, it's going to take me, you know, three, four years because I'm so far off it that's not worth it to me. I don't want it that much to invest that effort. And that's absolutely fine. But until you've gone through that exercise, you can't make an informed decision as to whether it's worth it or not. And a lot of people, I think, because they've, their goals are vague and they've never gone through this exercise, they're mindlessly chipping away at completely unreasonable targets. And they end up becoming demotivated, not even progressing along that plan as well as they could if they, you know, if they felt like they were closer to success. So... Yeah, I think it's a really valuable exercise to go through to just say, right, where am I? What am I moving towards? How far away am I? And is what I'm doing working? And am I happy with the exchange that's going on here of my effort versus reward? Because enjoyment, obviously, is the biggest thing. It's like, for me, moving away, say, from strength training is the big thing for me because that's what i do what i love and i love to be strong and I, I that's why i'm still maintaining some lifts anyway a lot of it is just for well-being purposes but I, I like to lift and but i enjoy the challenge of running because i'm terrible at it and i enjoy cycling because i'm relatively okay at it so you know next thing you know i'm in a pool and now i'm doing an ironman who knows exactly. but yeah, yeah. i think i've already signed up for a duathlon so that's that's the first first tips are going for the full olympic distance but that's mainly because i'm so bad at something that's what i that for me my goals are ever changing because i love to do something i'm shit at and then become okay at it 
and then move on to a different one because at the end of the day, this is what I loved about CrossFit. It's the jack of all trades thing. And it, it exposed me to so many weaknesses and things that I'm okay at and not mm. that great at that I can put all my efforts into certain things. I've done it with weightlifting. I've done it with gymnastics. I've done it with all these different things. It's just where something like say endurance is such a different thing to say lifting. It's, it's, that's how I think was the hardest part. So that was when I wrote down, you know, my smart goals, essentially, that was what then solidified it and kind of gave me a justification to myself that I could step away from the barbell and not be worried about it because I've got a great journey to come in say, say a year's time, for instance, that I can then start next year, 2022, pick up the barbell again and start building my strength back up. And like, how good is that? You get to essentially mm-hmm. be like a, a new newbie lifter again. That's going to yeah. be amazing. And it's, I think so many people are just scared to let go of that side of stuff. But I think that is because they don't, they lack a, a specific goal because mm-hmm. it means then you, then you are just wasting your time because then you're spending a year they're doing a bit of this, a bit of that. And you, at the end of the year, you've not actually achieved anything. You've just yeah. stayed beige. You stayed yeah. in the middle. And it's like, by then being cool, I'm going to just leave off the lifting, focus on endurance or whatever it is. Is in I'm going to focus my energy one place and go as hard as I can and see what happens. And then in the next year, stop, shot off. Who cares? It was an experience for exactly, a year. Yeah. I might absolutely hate it in a year's time. And that's completely fine. And I think that's the where people get so hung up with we we hopefully got a long life ahead of us, you know, longish that, you know, you can put these experiences in along the way and make giving yourself specific measurable goals along the way helps you je- justify it and tick it off the list. Say, well, yeah. it's working, it's working, it's working. So, yeah, nice point. I like that. Um, all right. So we've got our smart goal. We know what we're working towards and we've made sure that it's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. Nice. A little tongue twister. And so the next principle we want to talk about is progressive overload. It's a phrase that gets used a lot in training and otherwise. And it's pretty simple that you need to be progressively overloading whatever the goal of the program is. So the needle needs to be moving in the right direction, no matter how slowly. Um, So I think everyone understands that if you keep doing the same thing, your body's not going to adapt beyond that so the the stimulus needs to be increasing over time but the point actually I want to make about progressive overload is actually that generally the faster you go the more problems you're going to face and the less sustainable the progress is obviously if we've got a time bound goal we have a target for how much improvement we want to make um, in a certain period of time but going too quickly that's when injuries happen, like tendonitis problems from overuse. Like you've got, and the other point that's important is you can't keep adding weight to the bar at a certain rate. So when someone's starting, you know, they might be able to add 10 kilos onto their working weight for a few weeks, but you can only get away with that for so long before you hit a brick wall. So actually, the slower you go, the more sustainable that progress is. And the science behind this is that physiologically there is a rate limit for t- uh, for tissue adaptation like your body can only adapt so quickly so that will limit you at some point there's essentially an upper and lower bound to how quickly your body um, can make progress if you're competitive and you want to absolutely max out your progress all the time you're always flirting with that top end of the limit for how much progress you can make in how little time on the other end there's you're risking no stimulus so if you don't train hard enough your body's not actually improving at all however if you're just in that zone you can probably keep that rate of progress almost indefinitely but it is just very very slow so we're just trying to uh, decide where in that range our risk appetite is because the higher we go the more likely we are to get injured but the faster the progress if you go a little bit slower you're less likely to get injured. You're more likely to be able to keep up progress over time, but Mm. your results will take a little bit longer. So just having a bit of an awareness as to where on that spectrum you are, it's like investing your money. Like what's your risk appetite? Um, Mm. How quickly do you want to make some, some bucks? How quickly do you want to make some gains? Mm. And uh, yeah, just pitching, pitching yourself there. It's like that basic thing of, um, Oh fuck. I just had it in my head. Gone. (laughs) Oh, bollocks. Okay. Right. Okay. But no, with this progressive thing, it's just, 
the the obvious thing is when you look at the graph and they say like you know like and i think everyone knows the saying what goes up must come down so it's like just imagine if you steadily build this hill along a long journey the mm. way down is going to be a lot softer if you go up fast it's going to be a big drop basically like a roller coaster yeah. roller coasters we uh, how much i love them but it's like you go in vertical and then you're dropping down hard and fast whereas you know when you've got like the long loopy bit it's like yeah. it's fun but it's just you, it's just nothing's really happening but you just go <laughs> along it's just the the speed it's just the but train. when you have yeah when you have speed and yeah it's a train when you have <laughs> speed and you have the, the vertical side to it that's where shit goes down and it's like that's when you are looking to build strength over time it's so easy to want that end goal now mm -hmm. and we've all been we've all been there and we've all wanted to get there. and we've probably all done something that we shouldn't have and probably paid the price for it afterwards so it's you know it's just part of the journey but you want to be aware that the long-term gain is going to be just like in, as you said like with money like compound interest just compounding week after week after week and what you were saying there were like the minimum effective dose of doing just enough is good in some respects if you're not looking to be that competitive say that bit there but if you're looking to compete you got to push yourself and you have to flirt with the potential risk of injury because that's what gets you above everyone else if exactly. all you're doing is just enough then you're probably going to be get by just enough exactly so i think yeah. when it and also this is this little side topic with progressive overload so on netflix there's um, a lego marvel thing and um, so for some reason at the moment, Chloe's really into like Hulk, Captain America. So I'm like, it's great because I love all that shit. Yeah. Um, but one of the episodes basically is Loki. So obviously the Thor's half brother essentially has this stuff called Norfrost, which basically like overloads the person's body. Now, the reason where this is going from and why I've taken us off on the tangent is because there's a bit in there where... Thor goes to Loki and he goes, oh, I'm going to like stop you. And he, go, and he goes, oh, no, you're not. And he eats all of this Norfrost, right, which basically gives him brain freeze right. because he ate it too quickly. So then he had a crash yeah. and then he couldn't sustain the power and then Thor takes him out. So basically, that, that's, I think, the whole thing is doing anything too fast, even in the cartoon world of Lego Marvel, <laughs> is never a good idea. So let's look for that progressive overload. Um, but yeah, so I guess understanding exactly what you want from each session is where it starts becoming important because you've got the smart goal you know how to overload the body now to get there so making sure you're turning up in each session with like right this is my intent this is what i need to do and this is how i want to leave the session exactly i think um having a clear stimulus in mind for sessions even every exercise and every set basically it all ties back to that goal but what is the signal do you want to have on the body and what are you telling it that you want it to adapt towards? So I think an example that illustrates this point quite nicely is you can have the same session, say it's a set of intervals, like run intervals, let's say um, 10 by 400 arbitrarily and uh, with the same rest. For one person, if they're trying to work on their running technique and run efficiency, then their form starts to break down around rep seven, they should actually end the session there because continuing to run with bad run form, they're actually detracting from the goal of the session. They're, they're now, um, they're locking in bad run technique, which is actually against the purpose of the session. So this happens a lot in sprinting. The coach might say do six to 10 reps of 60 meter sprints but stop the session as soon as your form starts to break down or you get slower because then you're training slowness and mm. bad mechanics. However, the same 10 by 400 meter session for somebody working on their anaerobic uh, energy system development or their threshold, you're not so worried about their run technique. What you're worried about is that their heart and lungs are struggling and get into that real discomfort and learn to work beyond their current uh, work capacity so for them they should push on and finish the 10 reps even if they slow down and even if their run form doesn't look good but the point is having that clear stimulus and understanding for what the purpose of the session and the reps are means you can make a decision as to how to approach that session and it can be different depending on what your goal is so I think uh, having 
a bit of communication from your coach to just have that that key um, cue to say if you start to slow down in the session or I don't care just like push on get the work done mm. you need to you need to hurt for this one to get the benefit from it so just on that would you not say with the 10 by 400 even if your run form is the focus would you not say potentially increase rest time to then say still finish the work and still then and then because obviously if your run form is breaking down it's because you can't actually sustain that pace anymore so yeah. would would you say still cut the session as in, i know this is an arbitrary thing but as in like mm. if if that was someone was doing a workout like this and I said right i really want to get this volume in because i want to run 4k so yeah. i'm like i want to do this and this is focused purely on run form okay cool so what can i do now to to manage this and it's either one rest more or obviously move a little bit slower yeah right so then yeah. obviously that's that's so when you have a coach just like you said there you know make sure that someone says this is what you need to do if this happens yeah. so i guess if you don't have a coach that's where you need to weigh up and maybe have a plan b when plan a is right, i want to do them perfectly and then when it doesn't quite happen like that cool what do i go down to do i stop yeah. Or do I slightly change it and so forth? Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. It's a great right. tweak. Like more rest or even doing shorter reps. Like yep. switching to 300s, for example. You might be able to stay in, in good form for 300 rather than 400. They're all uh, valid tweaks to mm. optimize for the intended stimulus of good run technique. Yeah, and then I guess that obviously then boils down to then managing volume and intensity and training stress. So I guess it's like going doing so having that goal of the 10 by 400 as the example so obviously the volume there is to run 4k so you know you have to manage that and then so that's why where the intensity might drop so that you can still manage to maintain the volume and same as that the training stress will then drop down a little bit but you have to go at the end of the session and when you review it say have i got better by doing mm -hmm. those extra say three sets at a slower pace or as you said am i now just training myself to be slow yeah. Like that that's where the intended um, idea of I want this session to be working on run mechanics and having a specific intent for the session is so important and it's not just oh, 10 by 4 yeah exactly yeah I think it, it's all sort of ties together um, with the, pro, the progressive overload and the clear stimulus like when you're managing your volume and intensity the principle here is that we actually want a we want chronic training stress rather than acute training stress. So what that means is it's a long, steady buildup over time rather than short, sharp spikes. And the, I think the best way to describe this is imagine if you've got two people who both run 90 kilometers per month, one of them runs three kilometers every day and the other one runs 90 kilometers on one day. That's very obvious that one of them has a much greater acute stress on the body so if somebody runs 90k they're probably going to come out of it with some problems whereas if somebody runs 3k a day a lot of people do more than that and have no issues whatsoever and the body is able to adapt to that sort of consistent smaller dose much better than the infrequent aggressive dose and that's basically how we want our training to be is slow and steady build sending a consistent stimulus to the body to say i want to get good at running and over time we're increasing that volume so we might do 3k a day for a month three and a half k a day for a month 4k a day for a month and having an idea of that daily average i think is a great metric for um how 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 sharp that peak is and how aggressive mm. the stimulus is on the body the more aggressive the stimulus comes back to that progressive overloads uh, minimum effective dose versus maximal recoverable volume if we're doing big spikes we're flirting with injury risk much more than uh, if we're doing slow steady small increment build up and uh, yeah over time that's where the gains are at but people have these preconceived notions of Oh, I, like, I like to tell people that I've had a really big session or, you know, the, the classic run program with the long Sunday run. It has its place. And if you're training for a marathon or something, you know, you need to build up the capacity to work for extended periods of time. But actually, in terms of what allows your body to adapt most gently, the small, consistent doses uh, pays off better. Yeah, I guess once you're performing these type of like you know the volume and intensity is making sure that you're 
seeing how you feel during it, taking notes during the session, taking notes after the session, whether you have a coach telling your coach called this felt like this. So for instance, when I was uh, doing a, I did a cycle and a run yesterday, just it was pouring with rain is a bad idea, but so I started it and I was running uh, So I just got off the bike, uh, pulled myself away, started running first K felt like shit as it always does. Um, but it didn't feel as bad as it normally did. So I was like, right, cool, probably cause I've just got off the bike. And so then I'm going into it and I could feel myself losing midline tension. So basically I could feel my hips basically shift back and up as I back and just start what, what is it, losing any type of core control. And then as soon as I become conscious of that I, I tucked the hips under a little bit and just it gained a little bit more tension to it and just leant forward a little bit more to run into the run. And it was having that conscious awareness. So I was listening to the feedback on my body of what it was doing and it was, it was going to shit. So then I was like, if I couldn't, if I couldn't, um, you know, rein it in, then yeah. that was where I was going to stop. Because I said to myself, cool, I'm going to run up to 5K, but mm. I'm going to run. When I, when I start to lose, like, technique and stuff like that, then that's where I'm going to stop. Because the goal isn't to go to 5K necessarily. It's the goal is to see what it feels like going from bike to run and mm. like how long I can do it for at the moment and what sort of heart rate. My heart rate was in zone five the whole time. So <laughs> that my zone two running or even zone three running has gone to shit. But I, you know, it was that conscious feeling of, all right, cool, get the hips under. And it was, it was like, I then went against that. And the last, like the last 400 meters was just a hold on for, hold on for the 5K. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was listening to the feedback of the body. And I think that's essential, especially when you're doing any of these goals, because you have to be comfortable with making this, say, smart goal adaptable along the way and that's the thing it has to be able to be changed and you have to be confident with that and you have to understand that that's just part of the journey yeah massively and i think um you know it's all well and good having a clear goal and a nice program written out but life sometimes gets in the way so you might hit a performance plateau you might pick up an injury or a niggle you might feel energy levels dip poor sleep, like feeling fatigue, dip, dip in your sex drive. These are all sort of feedback and clues as to how your body is responding and getting on with the program. On their own, they might not mean anything, but the overall picture does tell you something about how, you, how well your body is responding to the training. And it's just that same principle of titrating it. Like, is it too much? Rein it in a little bit. Is it not enough? Am I actually feeling great and feel too good maybe I could train a little bit harder and progress a little bit faster push it um so you're always just listening to feedback not not being hypersensitive to the tiniest little niggle because especially if you're a competitive athlete you're towards that top end of maximal mm. recoverable volume so niggles especially in the lead up to competition are expected but um you know it is feedback if you're constantly getting niggles then maybe you're not recovering well enough from the training so what can you do you can either improve your recovery protocols we've done a podcast on our top tips for that or you can just reduce your training volume or intensity slightly to give your body a better chance of recovering but yeah i think the the principle there is listen to what your body's saying don't ignore it and uh, you can tweak and optimize your program to make sure you're staying on track constantly checking in with those measurable uh, performance indicators I mean, if you're not sure about if a niggle's becoming an injury we've done a podcast on that two episodes ago so do check that one out ash i think it's been brilliant today really enjoyed it i mean big takeaway for the listeners make sure that your smart goal is smart so make sure you've gone through it gone through your points is it specific is it measurable is it achievable? Is it relevant? And is it time bound? And then go through that same thing again, straight away after you wrote your goal and just double check. Is it that now you have a bit of an understanding and hopefully you've taken stuff from this podcast that you've been able to think, oh, actually might not be as, you know, time bound as I thought that might be a bit too soon. So maybe we've given you shed some light there, but we hope you've managed to get this, get some stuff out of this podcast, especially because we're going into February now and hopefully people are still with their January goals and they might need, this is a perfect time to review it and make sure you're not just saying, saying, oh, fuck it for the rest of the year. And then, <laughs> you know, losing all that initial <laughs> energy and drive. And then you've got still 10 months that you could be progressing. So just remember one fuck up day doesn't mean a fuck up month. <laughs> just, just, you know, take that day, write it off and move on to the next.
So I think that comes from me. I went through a tub of peanut butter yesterday. Nearly. It was about <laughs> three quarters. Chloe was just like, can I have some peanut butter? And I had this spoon and I was just going through it. And I was like, I shouldn't be doing this. And I was like, well, I've got to do it. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of went against my specific measurable goal at the moment. But it's a, it, today's a new day. So I'm moving on. But we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, as always, you know, we do really appreciate your feedback. If you did, please leave us some reviews on iTunes. You know, leaving the cheeky five star there really does help us grow. Uh, share this episode on any of your socials, Insta and all that lot. But apart from that, really appreciate the time. And we'll see you next week. Cheers, guys.